Good morning. It's a privilege to be with you again after doing presentations here the last several years. It's been a privilege. And um, this morning, I will share books into pictures. And this evening, 5.30, best person, I will share a look at Meyer Express, which is a testimony of how the Word came alive in my life and how we can rediscover, recapture the Word in different ways. It's really got to me. Well, here's one thing. Through some time, I have, you know, presented the whole Bible in one act. And you go through the Bible, through books, take things in, take things in, the big picture, so to speak. And also, it's been a privilege for many years ago to write the It Is Written program, George Vanneman, Mark Finley. And you go through the Bible, of course, researching, researching all kinds of topics. And so, something has come to me, okay? It's that <clears throat> there is a way in which a Bible book, the whole theme in a way, can come in to a theme that you can capture, capture and claim and use as a great resource, a wonderful resource. And that's what I'm going to share with you today, how Bible books can turn into pictures, okay? And how you can use them in a way so strongly. Now, I'm going to share you three Bible books and three prisoners. Three prisoners. This is about when things push you down. Ever think? Ever happened to you? Something kind of pushes you down? Troubled? How, when things push us down, we can keep looking up in a blessed way. A blessed way. These books Bible books are going to show you how you can look up. So bless when things are trying to push you down. Well, I'll give you one example. Push down. Gentlemen, did you ever try to change your oil in the car yourself years ago? You know, save money? Don't go to the gas station. Just change it myself. Well, this young father, young guy, is doing that crawled under the van, okay, took the oil all out, can't get the oil filter changed, but whatever, and then I walk up and I, oh, this is a van, okay, and I have to lift up the seat, the driver's seat, to put the oil in. The engine is below the seats in this van. Push it up, so I said, okay, oh, and I have to go through the passenger door, not the driver's door, because it's closed. The electricity, electric stuff, complicated things, somehow it got screwed up, and I, and I hadn't been able to open the driver's door for some days. What's going on? I had to go into the passenger and drive <laughs> over there. So I go up, okay, I'll just open it, and I try to open up the seat, and it wouldn't open up. It can't open up. What's going on? Oh, because the side, driver's side door, it wouldn't open. It was clucked. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, what? I, I tried, tried, tried. Oh, no. I, I, I've got to go to somewhere and have this door fixed, right? Oh, but I don't have any oil. <laughs> No oil in the van. I can't go. I can't. I can't. Uh. You ever had that happen? I can't. I can't. I can't. Push you down, right? So this guy, I'm sorry to admit it, but he was caught mad. <laughs> Real mad. Ran into the garage, get a pair of pliers. No? Okay, go into the kitchen, the con cruncher. I went to the door and I, and I pulled on everything. Pull, 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 pull. Open this door. And it wouldn't open. 
this guy got really mad. He started screaming. Thank goodness my little kids weren't around. <laughs> Couldn't hear me, but I screamed. And I even cursed. Terrible. When things push you down, sometimes you get really screwed up. Emotionally imprisoned to some bad thing in a way. Well, things like that. I'm going to show you how, like I said, push you down, we can keep looking up. And here's the first one. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Prophet in the Bible, right? What do you think of Jeremiah? What do you think of him? You know what? This guy was a prophet, preaching all the time, sharing, but it was like a prison, Jerusalem. Like a prison. He went through a lot of things because they didn't like him. He's preaching. Priests and prophets dragged him before civil authorities. They demanded capital punishment. Tried to. Couldn't quite. And then there was house arrest. Shut up, shut up, shut up. There was Jehoiakim. Ordered him arrested. Evade angry. He was beaten by priest Pasha. Beaten. Put in stocks. Many different things as the years went by. And even... Zedekiah, he was placed in a terrible dungeon for a while, in a real bad dungeon, and he almost died. It's only because some people managed to get him out. He almost died. And then finally, some officials, you know what they did? They lowered him into a well, and he's stuck in the mud for a while. <laughs> Gonna die. And someone begged the king to let him go. Was Jeremiah a prisoner? Yes. He was pushed down. He was trying to lift them up against their corruption, against their injustice, preaching. But they just pushed him down. Well, guess what? All that book, it's a long book, right? Many things. There is a way in which everything comes to a climax. A certain way, everything comes to a climax. Okay? And you can see it in a verse, chapter 21, up here. And I'll read the whole thing is, See, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine or plague. But whoever goes out and surrenders to the Babylonians, who are besieging you, will live. He will escape with his life. Well, at that time, the Babylonians were around the city of Jerusalem, invading, right? Nebuchadnezzar was going to get in, conquer. He was a big conqueror, right? And this Jeremiah was saying, surrender to them? What? What did the priests, king, officials, what did they say? He's a, he's a traitor. That Jeremiah, he's a traitor, Right? He's abandoned this holy city. We're supposed to abandon this holy city. Isn't it God's city? How can we abandon it? The temple? Does not God live there in the temple? How can we go? This is crazy. You're a traitor. You're palming shekels from Nebuchadnezzar, Jeremiah. That's what you're doing. They hated him, hated him. But Jeremiah had to say, God is going to discipline you as you give up because you've gone through some bad things adult idolatry idolatry you gotta get disciplined okay and he was saying that to them saying that to them and um, that big big place had to be surrendered see now what is our first reaction? You can go to the top one. Go to the top one. First reaction when bad things happen to us. You know what our basic reaction is? We're like dukes. We're a fortress, instinctively a fortress. That's just what we are. Something bad happens to you. You've got to resist, right? You've got to fight. That's natural. 
I mean, fight, yeah, bad things that happen, of course. You know, like a fortress. Push, push. That's how we are, instinctively, of course. And, well, you know what else when bad things happen to us? You know what we typically say many times? Lord, why did you let this happen to me? Why? You know, that's natural. And we resist, we fight, fight, and that's natural. But Jeremiah is showing us a white flag. A white flag. When something bad happens to you, raise up a white flag to the Lord. You surrender to the Lord. Not to the bad thing, bad people. Surrender it to the Lord. Here it is, Lord. This is what's happening to me. This is the bad thing. You surrender it. A big white flag above the city. That's his theme. And it brings in so many things. So many things. And there it is. Each of us is instinctively a fortress, defensive when we react to misfortune. Jeremiah is a white flag. Surrender the city. Surrender the city. Now, look down. I will show you how so many things in that book come to this climax, okay? Go to the down one. Here we are. Jeremiah's heavy words about unwashable stains, stubborn hearts, false peace, adulterous idolatry, cruel oppression. They're all ways to lead up to a call to surrender. All those telling them, condemning, lead to a call to surrender. And then his bright pictures, prophets have dark and bright, of course, his bright pictures, wounds healed, health restored, yoke of slavery broken, a law written on the heart, righteous branch ruling. All these positive things are relate to the city after surrender. They're a positive thing about what will happen to you if you really, really surrender. Really surrender. That's what he says. Surrender the city to the Lord. That's his theme. So much of the book into that. Well, guess what happened to me? Changing oil. You know, I'm sitting in the passenger seat and I'm screaming, right? Well, after a while, I start getting guilty. Oh, no. Steve, what are you doing, man? And I, and I repented. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was so mad. I laid it out to him, I'm sorry. This is terrible. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with this van, but I lay it out to you. And I, <clears throat> and I told him to do that. And um, something hit me about it. Um, the door handle driver's door handle. I'd been grabbing everything, remember? <laughs> yeah. But somehow, what? Door handle? Okay. It just struck me. Open the door handle. The door opened. Boom. I hear it. Like a choir singing. <laughs> it was so nice. Oh, thank Wow. Well, that is one example where I learned. Terrible thing. I surrendered to the Lord. Wow, does he do good things? <laughs> does he get me to a good thing? That was my testimony. I could see that. Yes, when we surrender the city to the Lord, to the Lord, something good can happen. Okay, here's the second one. Second picture. Okay? Daniel. You've heard of him, of course. Big prophet, right? Daniel. Was he a prisoner? Yes. He was royalty in the group of royalties. And then Babylonians. He exiled, taken out to there. And he was part of the group that they were going to try to teach to be their leaders. You're going to be their Babylonian leaders. Babylonian religion. What did this Daniel do? What are the events that he did? It's very interesting. You can go to the bottom. Very interesting. The things that happened in Daniel. First one. 
He was assigned to royal food, of course, royal food. And he realizes, oh, I'm, I, that Old Testament laws about don't eat this, don't eat that. What did he say to them? What did Daniel say to them? Uh, sorry, I got a weird religion. I can't eat that. Can, he, can I eat something? That, no. You know what he did? This is amazing, okay? First, comparative dietary study. This was the first of the world, believe it or not, comparative dietary story. Because he said, could you give us 10 days? Just, just 10 days. Me and my other Israel people, okay? This was the royal food. Other people can have it. We're going to do the Jewish food. And after 10 days, you show, you, you'll see whether we are better or not. Well, okay. What happened after 10 days? They were fine. He showed them that God's diet is better. Showed them. It's better. He didn't just scream. Okay, second thing. Remember when King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream? He had a dream that struck him, of course, very much. And he was wondering, what, what, what does this mean? What does this mean? So he asked the uh, wise men who interpreted his dream all the time. And he said, okay, you're, you're supernatural. Tell me what I dream. If you're so su super... Well, they, I, 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 well, we can't... We can't, can't what? Well, he was going to kill them. Take their heads off. But Daniel heard about it, didn't he? And what did Daniel feel? Hey, there is a God in heaven who can reveal mysteries. I think there's a God who can show you things. And Okay. Nebuchadnezzar had him come in and he, and he told him the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar actually, he, 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 he showed the dream. He learned the dream himself. And he showed an amazing prophecy about empires coming for centuries ahead. That is one of the biggest prophecies in the entire Bible. It is amazing. Centuries of empires in the future, and he had predicted it. Does God know the future? <laughs> I think so. Well, well, Daniel showed God's way is better. Right? Okay, here's another one. This is Persia. He was even in Persian. And there were politics going on in Persian. And some rulers said, hey, let's have them all pray to the Darius. You know, King Darius. Nobody else. Anybody prays to anybody else, they go to a den of lions. Den of lions. What did, what did Daniel do? Well, there was a tradition, actually. There's a tradition where um, he had to open the window and you pray toward Jerusalem. That's what they did. Pray toward Jehovah, pray toward Jerusalem because you got to, that direction. And so he had to do that. And it, well, they saw him. Ah! He's praying to somebody else. He was thrown into a den of lions. What happened? Nothing. La, la, la. Hello, lions. Hey. Showed again. God's way is better. And he did it in various ways. The last one here, instead of giving in as an exile, a captive, Daniel affirmed something greater. This is what he did in various ways. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. So positive about the Lord. Showing that. There was even a pagan queen of Belshazzar. You know what she said about him? There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him and wisdom like that of the gods. An extraordinary spirit. Yes. Now go to the top because Daniel's theme is resist by showing that God's way is best. That's how you resist. Now, Daniel was in a foreign place, foreign stuff. He had to resist, didn't he? How did he resist? By showing that God's way is best. And this is, this is sort of the picture in his book, in a way. He lifted up God's banner, and even in Babylon. This is, these, are, these are Babylonian, actually. Walls. And this is just an example for me, just an example, because God 
as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And in one place he's described, the Lord is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So that's sort of just an example of this Daniel lifting up the lion of the tribe of, du of Judah even in Babylon. And how is he doing? Resist by showing that God's way is best. That's how he resisted. And it was a very, very good thing for him. Well, folks, we've seen two pictures, two books, two pictures, okay? Jeremiah, Daniel. Resist. One is resist, then one is surrender. And you surrender the city, but you surrender it to the Lord. You resist but you resist by showing that God's way is best. You do both. Both. Now, there is a way in which different people do things in different ways. Weak people and strong people, sort of. People that are kind of weak, you know what they do a lot? Surrender all the time. They surrender to everything. Yeah, yeah, give me, give me. Right? If they're weak, surrender, surrender. Now, if you just surrender to everything, you know what happens? Eventually, you surrender to sin. You give in to sin. It's not so good. Resist. Some people resist all the time. Strong people resist, resist, and they'll fight anything, anything. Tendency to resist, resist. What happens if you resist all the time? You eventually will resist the Holy Spirit. <laughs> The Holy Spirit t has teaching you something, isn't he? With some problem. He's trying to teach you something, isn't he? Just, just, just resist. Just be a tower. Ah! So instead of that, surrender to the Lord. Give it up to the Lord. You don't surrender to the bad people. Surrender to the Lord. I give it up to you. You will show me something good. Resist by showing that God's way is best. Resist some bad thing, showing that God's way is best. These are wonderful ways of dealing with things that push you down. Wow, how you can keep looking up and be edified, edified. Now these two people, they have the right to challenge us to do this. They have the right. God has given them in the Bible, created their books in the Bible, Jeremiah. Does he have the right to challenge you to surrender? Yes. <laughs> he was a prisoner. He went through horrible things through the Lord. He has the right to ask you to surrender if something bad happens to you. Yeah, even worse happened to him. You can surrender. Daniel, does he have the right to ask you to resist? Show that God's way is best. Yeah. Sometimes you're pushed. You have to resist. <laughs> he has to resist a lot more. And he has the right to ask us to resist by showing the God's way. These two books have a privilege of challenging us. Surrender and resist in a certain way. Okay, now the final, the third book. Third book is Philippians. Philippians. Who wrote Philippians? Paul. Now, what kind of person was Paul. You know what? He's a type A personality. Very strong type, you know. He'd been all over the area around Mediterranean, preaching, preaching, evangelism, all kinds of things. And he had created church and formed the church and instructed them. He was a very strong type A personality. Well, where was he when he wrote Philippians? He was in Rome, and he was imprisoned in a house, stuck in some house, soldiers around him. He couldn't go anywhere. What do you think that was like? And also, he was in a sentence. He was waiting to hear a sentence. He could have been killed, okay, totally killed, or he could have maybe gotten get get away. 
What is that like? Have you ever been sitting there and waiting for some terrible, am I going to get out or am I going to get crushed? You know, you don't know. That's tough. Now, a type A personality, a strong personality, who had been doing all kinds of things and now is stuck, he would go crazy. Any type A personality who was just imprisoned in a way, they would go crazy. I guarantee you. What did Paul do? What did he do? Folks, this is amazing. Do you know that Philippians is one of the happiest epistles in the New Testament? Do you know? Delight in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice always. Things like that. Philippians is one of the happiest books, epistles in the New Testament. Wow. That's amazing. You know, to me, this Philippians is almost like you get a card, a, a happy card from somebody in a hospital. <laughs> from somebody in a hospital and sends you a, be, have a nice day, have a lovely day, happy, and they're in a hospital. Something like that. Card, that's what Philippians is amazing. Okay? It's remarkable. Now, let me show you the themes of this book how they come together. It is amazing, folks. This is amazing because it's about looking up either way. So much. Looking up either way. Here's the examples, okay? Whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, either way, all of you share in God's grace with me. See, he doesn't know whether he's going to be in chains or out defending. Which way, which way? But either way, whatever happens, I can affirm this positive thing. All of you share in God's grace with me. That's cool. Right? Here's another one. Whether I come and see you, he doesn't know whether he's ever going to be able to get out of that prison thing. Whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, either way, you stand firm in the one spirit. He could affirm something. Either way, he could affirm something positive. You stand firm in one spirit. That's cool. Okay, the next one's down. Next ones are <clears throat> some preach out of envy and rivalry Selfish ambition. Others are preaching outside while he's in prison. Can you imagine how tough that was? This biggest preacher of all. And then there's other people now just preaching. No, you can't. Uh, could drive them crazy. But he says, some preach out there. There's some envious people. Out of envy and rivalry, selfish ambition. Others preach out of goodwill, out of love. This way, that way. But either way, Christ is being preached. That's what he said. But either way, Christ is being preached. That's cool. I like that. Okay? And here it is. Whether I am to go on living in the body or die. He doesn't know whether he's going to live or die. Is that tough? <sighs> live or die. Well, either way, to live is Christ, fruitful labor, to die is gain, depart and be with Christ. He could affirm something positive, even in waiting for life or death. Man, does Paul look looking up either way? That's a fantastic theme in this book. We can claim. Claim it. Definitely claim it. Now, this is the picture that I have put in. That's all picture of this book. Above the clouds, blue sky. You know why? Have you ever flown? Flown out of an airport? And you have you ever flown through a rainy day through clouds? Hey! I just I just did that LAX coming here to Tulsa. It was cloudy. It was raining in the valley, big rain. What happens when you go through the clouds every time in the day? 
you go up, no matter how dark the clouds are, how rainy it is, what happens when you go up through the clouds? Blue sky, <laughs> sunshine, every time. Well, that's just an example of how he is. Whatever underneath us, you go up and there's a blue sky up there. The Lord God, the light of the world. He's up there no matter what, how dark the clouds seem. Up there, looking up either way. That's a positive thing, my friends. Such a positive thing. Whatever we're facing, rain or sleet or snow, the sun is still shining above the clouds. I put that in there. And God can be glorified in any situation. That's what he does. All these things, either this or that, this or that, God can be glorified in any situation. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. And there's a way, my friends, in which we can lift up this blue, this white, lift up white flag, surrender, surrender, lift up this mighty Lord, line of the tribe of Judah, Resist by showing that God's way is best. Do both of those up into the blue sky. Looking up either way. See, these two come together. You lift it up, lift it up, and you lift up into the sky. Yes, I'm going to look up either way because God can be glorified in any situation. Amen? He can be glorified in any situation. Well, my friends... I have to tell you about someone who showed me example of looking up either way that I will never forget. Umberto Noble Alexander. He was a pastor for youth in Cuba. Cuban pastor. Back when the decades and Castro had those prisons. And um, Umberto was out going to the youth some people came to him. They took him to the prison. He would be in prison for almost like two decades. And he was almost like a young man to an old man, almost. Tough. And you know, Castro's prisons were tough, man. Very tough. Very tough prisons. Torture stuff. And I actually talked to him because he was going to be uh, interviewed in It Is Written. And he came over, and I interviewed him first to go through his story and to show them, George Vandam, and this is how we can ask him. And I had grown up in Mexico and Colombia, so I could talk to him in Spanish and tell him he could tell me everything in Spanish. Well, this is one thing that's remarkable as he talked to me about his experience. Remarkable is in that prison, of course, you couldn't do any evangelism. No church. You couldn't have any kind of church thing. No way. But he managed to talk to people around him, outside, you know, just pretend like, blah, blah, blah. but he would have preached to them. And he would preach sermons many times, just pretending like they're just looking. But one time, guards noticed, and they shot him. They shot him through his hand. <laughs> Just one little thing like that. Another thing Umberto did, he managed to, to sneak a Bible in. That was a miracle, too. Sneak a, they'd never allow a Bible. And he got the Bible, and as he's preaching to people in these many places, you know, prisons, he would have a string, and he would hand the Bible over to that one. You read this in John. And then over there. And you read this in John. And he would send the Bible around to different prisoners. Okay? And then, of course, one prison guy, guard, saw the Bible. Ah! Hey, you can't have a Bible. You know what Umberto told him? Oh, I have permission for that. What? No, you don't. I'll show you permission. I have permission. Okay. Let me show you. It's in here. 
and he gave him the Bible in his prison, and he read a verse of the Bible preaching the Lord. <laughs> and, the, and the guard said, Oh, come on, give me that. He wouldn't give it to him. He wouldn't give him back. And guess what? A guard, before you go inside a prison, he, you have to have two guards. It's just one of the rules. You can't go in, in a prison by yourself. So he ran out to get another guard, and Humberto had some little place like he snuck way down and, and, and hid the Bible. And when they came in, give. And he was tortured, of course, he was in prison, but he stayed with his Bible. It's amazing. Now, he told me something that I found incredible. This Humberto baptized 200 fellow inmates in that prison to the Lord Jesus. He baptized 200? How did that happen? There was no way you could do any church thing, any Christian thing. How would you baptize people? So I asked him, how did how, that happen? He told me how he did it. The prisoners would go through the mess hall, you know, there's different parts of the prison. One group would walk in, eat. Another group had done, walk out. Certain time. Each one had to do certain things. So, and they would walk in through trough of water. Little trough of water here. Okay? Walk out, walk out. Well, Umberto would say, the man who wanted to get baptized, he said, you go in, and I'll get in the group going out. And you come in, and I'm going, and we'll walk. And, he, and other people helped him too. All these other prisoners, several, several of them, they would walk, and they, and they walk slowly and push together. They'd be very together, slowly together, slowly together, and he would get the man who wanted to be baptized, grab him, put him in the water, baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the God, the Father, <laughs> baptize him. And they walked. Amazing. <laughs> baptized him. Prisoners hiding him, in a way. But there was something that I realize, I, I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> this guy is put into the water. We, we baptize into the water, don't we? Baptize into the water and get up. Well, he's totally wet walking out, right? Don't the guards see that? And I ask him, Humberto, but didn't they see that? Would they punish you again seeing that, you know? But they do, because I, I can't even describe to you some of the punishment he had. It was, oh, okay? And imagine, I just wondered, would, would you get caught? A wet man <laughs> was baptized. I will never, ever forget the way he answered me. You know what Umberto told me? He said, yeah, sometimes they would catch him. Sometimes, sometimes I got punished. But either way, he was baptized. I would never forget that. Man, it was so, so torturing. But either way, he was baptized. Did Umberto look up either way? Yes, yes he did. I praise the Lord. So much for him. Amazing. Amazing. Well, my dear friends, these three books, three pictures. You know what? I was talking to Pastor, and, uh, and he was telling, I asked him about his themes. You know his themes? He's done so well in this church for a while, a uh, personal relationship with Christ for a while, and our hands, his touch, things like that. Well, this struck me. Hey, hey. The, these book themes, 
they will enrich your relationship with Christ. Enrich your relationship with Christ. And our hands, hands, yes, reach up your hands. Surrender to the Lord. Reach up your hands. Resist by showing that God's way is best. And our hands surrender to Him. Show Him His way is best. And you'll get edified by His touch. You'll get edified by His touch. So I hope you'll remember these. Surrendering to the Lord, not to the evil, of course. Surrendering to the Lord. Giving up to the Lord. Resist by showing that God's way is best. And putting that into a blue sky, looking up either way. Because God can be glorified in any situation. Oh, I praise the Lord for these themes, these Bible books. And may you, my dear friends, be blessed, blessed by these books.